It's so easy to sign up to things these days. I don't think about what's happening with my data after. We shop online, we fall in love online, we go to work online. If we have a commitment to a private life, how does that translate to the online world? And the answer is it doesn't very well. We give you this search engine or this service for free, inverted commas, in return for your data. That's the model on which the internet has been built. And that's very questionable, but it's a difficult one to change. As soon as you engage in any type of online activity, social media or browsing websites, you're leaving behind a trail. It's essentially collecting telemetry from you as a user. A data broker could know things like your date of birth and your address and how long you've lived somewhere. But they also probably know your job, your role, your income, your marital status, the number of children that you've got, your dependents, your propensity to get cancer. And the level of detail can become quite concerning. The data is being collected to create ever more perfectly targeted advertising. That is not really one of the great goals of humanity. Red or crap, aluminum packaging. I can't imagine with the amount of surveillance that's going on around the world, what folks like Joe Stalin wouldn't have made him at all. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, George Orwell would, would turn in his grave to know what is happening now in terms of surveillance of citizens. I'm all for people being aware of some of the risks attached to data, but I certainly don't want people to be scared because there are huge benefits. You know, the long and the short of it is that people will live longer. They will have better lives. Alexa, what do you do with my data? Your data allows me to respond to you and helps me learn from our interactions so that I can better help you. Welcome to our connected world, where we can have everything we want at the touch of a button. But is it always as welcoming as it may appear? We've set out on a journey across the UK to discover our attitudes to online privacy. What happens to all the information we put online? Who owns it? Where does it go? And as users, do we actually care? Have I a look at you or yeah, the camera? Look at me. Is that so, right? Yeah. Okay. Do, do you feel that you're quite sort of safe online? No. Um, I would say yes. Yeah, I always say you accept every, all the cookies, whatever. Yeah, because otherwise the websites don't work properly. I have the opinion that in the end, if they want data, they can find it, so I'm not too concerned about it. When it comes to like, data selling and stuff, I know like Facebook got in some trouble with this and different stuff. But, I mean, it makes me a bit like uncomfortable to think about, but you can't really do a whole lot about it, so... <laughs> it's obviously not ethical, but, I mean, nobody's going to boycott social media. Could you just give us your um, email address and your phone number, please? Sure. Phone number as well. What is your email address? You and all seven. Oh, wait, hang on a minute. <laughs> Over the past 20 years, obviously, we, the internet has become a massive part of all of our lives. And the way that we sort of encounter the internet, I think, is through companies. And, and the vast majority of that has been led by targeted advertising. And what all of this really depends on is data capture. Not only are companies trying to understand really intimate details about us, you know, be it our shoe size or what our favourite colour might be, all the way through to what we call predictive analytics. Because once you have enough data about somebody, you might be able to predict other things about them. We've become used to giving over our data in order to get a specific outcome. So to get a deal when we're buying something online or to get better profiling of our interests on social media. That's a trade-off between the privacy and the security aspect and the convenience of getting a better deal, whether that's a monetary deal or whether that's a, a social deal. That means that looking forward, apathy becomes something of a threat um, because apathy is there to be exploited. If people don't care about the amount of information that they're giving over, then it's all too easy for companies, platforms to collect more and more data, to merge those data sets in ways that they might not necessarily have been given informed consent by users to do. It's worth just thinking about like what, why this data is so sensitive. The idea that your health data might just be floating around the internet, I think to most people would be quite shocking. Now that's precisely the case. It might not be the same data that your GP holds, but it's certainly, there will be companies on the internet trying to guess, you know, at the state of your health. 
I think that, that we really do need a sort of a wake up moment where we recognize just how vulnerable each and every one of us is, and it doesn't matter who we are, to having data about us collected and built and, and profiles of us built by, by companies that we don't know. Going back even to the Middle Ages, we've had a social contract between societies and governments that human beings can expect a certain amount of privacy, particularly in their own homes. Now, when we move to the internet, the concept of what expectation we can have as privacy has then changed. It's somewhat like the image of boiling the frog in the pot. You know, if, if you put it in the pot and you bring it to the boil slowly, the frog doesn't jump out and lo and behold, you end up in a bad place, certainly if you're the frog. I think, unfortunately, the erosion of privacy globally is like that. We're all getting boiled, and but slowly. And what's most fascinating to me is, is, the, is, the, is the sort of uh, acceptance, the comfort fact that people generally are having about giving up their privacy, I think, but candidly, it's because they don't appreciate the implications of it. And, and what's increasingly the case now, I think, is that we're beginning to see the evidence of the implications of why your privacy is so critical, so fundamental, and, and it's about time we got it back. Working with the think tank Demos and the consumer data champion Rightly, we enlisted four volunteers from across the UK and went on a data safari to understand the gap between what information they thought would be in the public domain and what was actually out there. I'm not really expecting much from this uh, project. I don't think that I've got that much of an online presence. I was interested because as a journalist, I'm quite concerned about my privacy. I've got a lot of information to sort of protect. And so I was really interested to see what sort of information had been collected on me just from my personal email account and all these um, companies that I've signed up for over the years. I just thought this project might be interesting just to see where my information is. Because of how much you do online and you just say yes to loads of things, so I would be very intrigued to see what people actually knew about me without me knowing. Okay, so I'm Ruth, I'm 67, I'm retired, and we live in a lovely, quiet-ish village in Cambridgeshire. We've got two children, and they both left home, although their stuff hasn't. Um, so my name's Otelia, or Tilly, I go by either. Um, I'm 22, I'm from London, and I work um, in sales. Born and raised in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, migrated to the UK in 2009 and now in Edinburgh. I'm 42, single. They work for a civil service at Companies House. Uh, I'm a data journalist, so I use data to find stories um, or run in analyses or investigations. I would not describe myself as tech savvy. Um, I'm not tech savvy at all. If you ask me how to change my ringtone on my phone, I probably have to, um, what do you call it? Is it YouTube it? Wake up, that's the first thing I do. Scroll through Instagram or something, as you do. Um, do my Wordle. A lot I do do on my phone is related to social media as well. I think I'm probably below average using technology because I don't use social media at all. I don't do Facebook and any of those sort of things. I'm not on Instagram and Twitter, uh, et cetera. I've only just got Facebook. Um, I buy a lot online, an awful lot online. I do do a lot of online shopping. Um, everything I do tend to buy is through an app as well. I do sign up for quite a few things, like um, you know, subscribing to newsletters and stuff like that. So. Yeah, maybe now I think of it. Yeah, maybe I am on, have an online presence, yeah. My attitude to privacy, I think it depends of the mood you're in when you're doing what you do. Um, so sometimes you might be more careful than other times. I think when you're approaching something you, that you're not familiar with, you tend to be a bit more careful. Probably don't think about it as much as I should. The online privacy thing is a, is a big thing. I just don't like that idea of, of my information being out there or what people will do with it. I'm a private person. Um, I'm also, and my husband keeps telling me this, I'm risk averse. So for example, I don't let anything with our names or addresses on or anything else about us go into our 
rubbish bin. And on the internet, I just put in lots of stuff without really thinking about it. That is the difference. The information about me will be name, date of birth, address, email address, and not much else. Sound familiar? This is how most people view personal data, but there's so much that's unknown and hidden. It was only a few years ago that we began to understand the power of the data that's kept about us without our informed consent. Johnson's slogan of get Brexit done was simple yet effective. And how it influenced major elections on both sides of the Atlantic. Go back a few years, go back to 2018 when we had the Cambridge Analytica scandal. I think the reason that issue resonated at that time is it, it did two or three things. It told people that the amount of data that is gathered about them online is far more than they think it is. And also that um, you know, apps, you know, big social media apps like Facebook, were gathering data about what you did, not just when you were on their service, but using lots of other apps as well. No one would have thought that would have been the case, that simply by searching for something on a search engine, visiting another website, that Facebook will be gathering data about that as well. Perhaps what we haven't thought about is why am I getting this product for free? Um, that's the bargain that we've struck. Now, unfortunately, I don't think that bargain has been struck on very good terms. The digital advertising world has been fed by the data we provide from our journeys across the web and how it tells advertisers and brands and agencies who we are, what we like, what we do, so they can then um, target us with, with personalised advertising. And so we're the people who provide that pop-up message that you see whenever you travel the web, which is where Accept All kind of lives. From May 2018, when the General Data Protection Regulation finally was being enforced, the data controllers had to ask for that explicit consent for the users to capture and use their data. One of the challenges kind of managing consent that, that data controllers kind of have is they may allow permission for um, one of their partners to collect that data and process it to, to, to kind of solve a problem, to deliver a service, and that's part of their request to users to consent for that. But the analogy we've heard is like some of them put the foot in the door and allow a lot of other partners in to process data without you knowing. Well, the, the next time you access a website and the little pop-up appears, just have a look at the list. You'll see dozens that you have never heard of, you know, these are data brokers. Their role is to buy and to sell that that data to comp to other companies. They aggregate the information, and the harm is it's selling what your habits are to advertisers. It's essentially a breach of your privacy if you think about it. A lot of the data that these data brokers gather, they'll say it's anonymized, so you can't just search up an individual's name and find them. But actually, what we've seen in recent cases, for example, with data brokers selling their information to ICE, the Immigration Enforcement Agency in the US, is that they're specifically boasting about the ability for you to de-anonymize the data. There was a study which found that 99.98% of people could be identified on an individual level based on just 15 different data points, their, sort of, uh, their age, their ethnicity, their marital status, that sort of thing. In the work that we're doing here at Demos and in partnership with Rightly, we are looking to use a tool that came out of GDPR, what is called a subject access request, which allows anybody to get in touch with the company and say, hey, what data have you got on me? Now, that process is laborious, it's difficult, it's technical, but it is the first step in allowing people to say, well, look, I want to know what you know about me, and ultimately I have the right to ask you to remove that data. So what you're seeing is it's not just in one place, it is moving around. So my data has gone data broker, data broker, um, and web clubs. How could you ever expect to find where your data is unless you tell all of these people, I do not want you to have my data, I want you to delete my data, and I don't want you to ever use my data again. So that's what we did. Our plucky participants spent three months discovering and purging their data footprint and found some surprising results. I think, you know, I, from the last time we spoke, it'll be interesting to see what you have actually found um, because someone might have more information 
on me than, you know, just my name or something like that, which would be more than what I'd expect them to have. Thanks. Thank you. What jumped out at me at first was, I guess, the volume of emails that we sent out, um, or that rightly sent out on my behalf. And that within, you know, that only 26% of them actually replied. I was surprised at how many companies have my email address. There were some uh, 200 uh, or so companies um, and I sort of I emailed around 70 of them to try and get them to delete my data. Some of them were very good about it and they sort of deleted it straight away. Others sort of were trying to get me to send them more information so that they could uh, find out who I was and delete my information. One of them you had to register online and then wait for a password to come in the post. Of Then you go in and then you request your stuff, which I do remember thinking, like, if I was doing this for, like, real, like, I know I'm doing it for real, but it's for this project, but if I was doing this because I was genuinely concerned about what was out there, like, it's a job in and of itself. I hadn't realised that when... I just accepted terms and conditions that that meant the company I was saying that to could then sell my information on. Uh, OK, so I can see here about uh, these data brokers, which I didn't actually know much about. This one by Cato. It's like four years of my bank balances or current current and other bank account details, um, which is interesting. Yeah, not too sure why they would have that. This Experian propensity document is interesting. It's kind of funny how detailed this is. With whatever information they have, they're making assumptions. They're not necessarily getting it right. Places to visit in spare time, cinema. Do you think that's true or not? No. That's just appalling. They think the newspaper, my main daily newspaper, is the Daily Mail, which <laughs> is totally wrong. You've got a high probability of purchasing a second-hand car. Wrong, because I don't drive. Most of this, actually, maybe I don't like it, really, that they're making these assumptions. But I don't need to get a mortgage. There are lots of things that would matter more to a younger person, I think. Going forward, if I um, want to get a mortgage or anything, like this is the information that they would take it from. If I did go and apply for a credit card or something and the application got declined, it didn't really give a reason as to why, no one would really be able to help me out and it would probably be due to like finding something online that had nothing to do with me that I, is out of my control. I recently was trying to raise my credit rating and I discovered that one of the things that was sort of suppressing it was the fact that I was not publicly on the electoral register. And I put myself on private specifically so as to protect that information and not make it public and not make it sellable to marketers. But I ended up having to make it public in order to boost my credit rating. When we first started, I, I didn't expect there to be much online about me. Um, but looking at this Experian um, report, this Facebook, and as well as the Amazon, there's quite a lot more than what I had expected. And like, and especially this Experian that picture that they're trying to build of me, it is quite concerning because it is again like just this information about me that's out there that isn't actually correct. I've had my Facebook account for about 10 years, so some of the interests that I might have, you know, things I might have enjoyed 10 years ago, they're still pulling that information as, as interest to this day, but um, it's so irrelevant to who I am now. I think it is slightly worrying to some degree because it kind of makes you feel like someone's building a persona of you that isn't, well, it's a completely different image as to who you are as a person. I think if you've agreed to something, then you've agreed to it, haven't you? But, but there needs to be a better system, doesn't there? So that people know 
what they're agreeing to. But what's the danger of having your personal information loose in cyberspace? Does it really matter? And what can go wrong? The more people you hand over data to, the more that you're putting yourself at risk. Let's say, for example, the organisation has been breached. You don't know to look out for it, so it's very easy to be able to say, we know this about you, um, we're from X or Y, and it sounds very convincing, and it's easy to be fooled. There are examples then of um, people phoning you up and saying that they're from your bank um, and being able to take you through security because they know some information about you. Data is incredibly powerful. It's clear that cyber criminals understand the value of data. You know, that's the value of your personal data, the value of your company data. There are lots of different things they can do with it to make money, uh, and that's their business model. And so understanding how your data is accessible, who's got it, what they're doing with it, is becoming increasingly important and people are really beginning to focus on that. There's a scam out there for everybody. We think that it's around 3.5 million people every year, but we don't know the true response because we estimate between 5 and 15% of people report it. It's easy to buy a list on the internet, so you could go on and go, I want to buy a list of people that are this age, that read this newspaper, that might have bought this sort of product. Now, you can key in certain types of products, which could mean a disability, which could mean you spend more time at home, which means you're more likely to answer the telephone or respond to a scam favourably. So it's all different angles. We don't actually know what the scale of it is, but we're talking about a £10 billion year loss to the UK economy without all of the additional onset, like the wellbeing impacts, the mental health impacts, uh, the additional support needs that people might need once they've become a victim of fraud or scams. It tends to happen when you're at home, which you tend to think of as a safe place. You know where you are, you, you, you feel secure. Uh, and so there's a real intrusion if somebody manages to scam you. And I think the other contributing factor is that people then feel also complicit. The scammers always ask for you to do something, to click on a link or to provide information. I got a phone call and they said they were from BT Openreach. And so I said, how do I know you're from BT Openreach and it's not a scam? Believe it or not, I actually said that. And they said, if you look on your phone, they said to me, um, you will see that someone's been trying to hack your phone. You'll see it says uh, somewhere from America. And I looked on there and it actually said America or Canada or somewhere. And so they said, if you can help us download this, um, um, what do they call it? App. So I uh, assist and, uh, and then we can help you. And then they said, we need to transfer some money over to the scammers and uh, then you'll get it back later. And then all of a sudden, tup, 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 all this money started disappearing. That's why I feel so... But the guy is going, it's fine, it's fine, you'll get the money back, you'll get the money back. And I just did, I must have been... That's why I feel so stupid really doing this. So we're wired to react to pressure. And that's what the, the, the sort of selling process is, the scamming process is. Um, whether it's a, a, a sort of more normal selling process about you've got to sign up for a ki new kitchen, uh, I can only offer you this offer while I'm here, when I go it'll have gone, or whether it's a scam, we feel that sense of urgency that we've got to do that and we've got to respond. We don't have a different response if we need to transfer £10 or £10 million. It's the, it's the psychological impact of the sense of pressure that's the important there that makes us feel like we've got to do something. Every time I hear the word scam on the telly, it just comes back. It just c comes back all the time. I just cannot get over it. What impact has that loss of money been for your love? Well, yeah, I could have... <laughs> Yeah. I could have helped my daughter more, put it that way. Yeah. So if I was mugged on the street and somebody stole my purse, I would be treated as a victim of a crime and probably visited by a police officer. If I 
gave away my purse from my living room via my computer, I don't get that same treatment, but the wellbeing effects of it are potentially the same. A lot of people, including in the police, have often seen this as a victimless crime, but actually the impact on people emotionally and financially is very significant. You have victims of scams committing suicide, you have people losing their life savings, and also businesses, large and small, losing a lot of money, which has a huge impact on their employees, small businesses going out of business. So there really are victims to these forms of crime and they need to be taken much more seriously. Fraud and cyber make up about half of all crime, but you know, less than 3% of the police workforce specialises in, uh, in these kind of areas. And so the resource that we're putting into tackling it is nothing like in keeping with the scale of the problem. OK, so if our information falls into the wrong hands, we're all vulnerable to attacks, scams and manipulation. And the higher profile we are, the bigger that risk. But what role do the companies who gather our information in the first place play in this? Don't they have an obligation to protect us, especially the most vulnerable? Frances Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, spoke about this when you know, she revealed research that Facebook had done looking at Instagram users and showed that about, I think it's in this country, about 30% of teenage girls in, a, in this research sample that used uh, Instagram felt that they had heightened levels of anxiety and depression after using the app but they felt they could not use it because all their friends were on it and they didn't want to miss out on what they were doing. And the way they'll do that is by making sure that children establish habits before they have good self-regulation. By hooking kids. <laughs> by hooking kids. It's a whole toxic industry. It's toxic, media. but... Yeah, you still do yeah. it. It's like, a, it's like drugs, isn't it? It's yeah, but you need to fit in. Stop. But you need to fit in. You need yeah. to fit into, like... Because if I could drop social media right now, I would, but I don't want to not stand out, so I want to fit in, so that's why I've still got social media. So I feel like I can control myself on what I'm putting out there, but I can't control what's coming into me and what I'm seeing, and I can't... Con I feel like I almost can't control how long I'm on the social media platforms for. From their point of view, why would they want to regulate a nine-year-old watching pro like a movie that probably they shouldn't be watching? If it, every They're second, every second he's watching it, he's giving money to them. I think it is. What's the word I'm looking for? It's it's a it's a question of morales. It's a question of morales. Money is power. That's that's how they equal it. But power should power comes with responsibility. This is a sector built on the sharing and processing of data. And so data privacy should get us 80% of the way there. Man, this thing's almost empty. How much have you had anyway? You, you cannot take a kid into a, a bar and give them a gin and tonic. The person who takes them in, the person behind the bar, you know, everybody has a responsibility and everybody knows that responsibility and yes some underage kids do drink in bars but actually a lot of underage kids get kicked out of bars and that's what things like the age appropriate design code does it says before you think of rolling something out for a kid you have to consider the risks of your data practice so there is a role here for regulation to step in but how well is it actually working? Shame on you! GDPR, you know, is quite brilliant. It's not perfect, but actually how poorly has it been enforced? And if it was radically enforced, I think a lot of the subsequent legislation would not be necessary. You know, even though there's been 1,100 enforcements, um, we would sort of say well, there's, there's definitely not been as many enforcements as we would have expected. Certainly with the big tech platforms that if you legislate, and it does require legislation to do it, they will try and work within the legislation that's been created. If you don't legislate and you leave it up to them, then they won't do any more than commercially suits them. Are you willing to change your business model in the interest of protecting individual privacy? Congresswoman, we are have made and are continuing to make changes to reduce the amount of no, data. Are you willing to change your business model in the interest of protecting individual privacy? Congresswoman, I'm not sure what that means. I'm very disappointed in the political will to actually enforce, um, but not half as disappointed as I am 
in the tech companies sort of putting their hands in their pocket to resist enforcement uh, instead of putting their hands in the pocket to actually comply. We do think there's a certain level of data ethics coming in where there are kind of good actors out there who self-regulate in that way. When some of these companies don't make it easy to remove my data, it does make me rethink my relationship with them because obviously whenever I interact with them, I'm just giving them more data. And it's not necessarily about the fact that I don't trust them as a brand to not misuse my data. It's the fact that I don't know who they're selling it to and who that data broker is then selling it on to. The more we see privacy as being a requirement that consumers demand from the partners and the, the, the brands they work with, the more those brands will make a decision that they have to police themselves and police the partners they work with. Technology providers will have to be able to show that you can trust them with your data. Privacy is going to be a really positive point going forward. It sounds like we need regulation and that brands who focus on improving privacy could actually gain a competitive advantage. But if technology is the one causing a lot of these problems, maybe they're the ones who can fix it. Looking ahead, it's of enormous importance that if we are going to look to protect something like a right to privacy or a right to free, free communication, we need to look for technological solutions to, to, to that end. In the future, we'll see more and more ways that you can manage your own data. So I think there's businesses use a, a privacy control centers where you can see the data they've got on you, how they're using that data, and give you the, the tools to restrict that use. And I think that will be more and more prevalent. The, the sort of holy grail for, for organizations at the moment is a thing called uh, zero party data. And, you know, third party data, we we're all used to that, you know, cookies and the like. And the first party data where you go on a website, now they know you to, to a degree. And that first zero party data is where you offer up information about yourself, unsolicited somewhat. You say, hey, look, I trust you enough. I want to have a relationship with you. I'm going to offer you access to this information. And marketing departments the world over now are beginning to appreciate that that kind of information is hugely more valuable than anything else. The problem they've got is they're so conditioned by this notion of, well, how are we going to get it? How are we going to tease it out of people? They're on this trajectory of the way the web works today, yet more data, yet more databases, yet more silos. So, so we're about to flip it. Say, so look, you just ask the user for their permission to see this stuff. And if they grant it to you, you can offer your product or service. And that's precisely what this company, Enrup, that I founded with Sir Tim Berners-Lee is doing with Solid. And to do that, it says, look, every user will have their own personal data area. We call it a pod. And that's where you're gonna keep all your data. And I think the confluence of consumers who would rather you didn't do this to them, organizations that don't wanna do it anyway, and, and, and technology that allows developers with, with a very easy access to ask for users' permission to, to ac access certain elements, just certain elements of their data in order to get provision them a service, I think is, is where we need to go next. The policy makers are already working towards this, but they're doing it from a policy perspective. We're coming at it from the technical perspective. And we think the two of them, when they intersect, that's the magic right there. So unless we make this new world safe, you know, and we can, unless we can translate the sort of rules uh, and safeguards we've developed over very many years to try and keep people safe in the offline world, if we can't make them apply in the online world, then we're gonna take a massive backward step. So there we have it. The future of online privacy really depends on the right regulation, brands recognizing the opportunity, and new technology but the main ingredient on deciding what the future looks like is us. Everybody is in the crosshairs here, and the sooner that we're able to take steps to protect ourselves and to push back against data exploitation and cybercrime, the better. It all starts with getting some of the basics right, and the basics keep changing because it's always a game of cat and mouse. It's not something that you can just do once, change the security setting, and then think, fine, you know, that's me sorted for the rest of my life. We need to stay on top of it.